What is your conviction? Does anybody have any convictions in here? What does it mean? <laughs> conviction. What is the so? How about uh, start the back, Pastor Charles? Conviction. Give us one conviction you have. Uh, what are you worth? What's worth dying for? How was that? Dying for my family. Whoa. Conviction, family. Okay, next person. Miss Catherine, what's uh, give us a conviction? What conviction do you have? Confliction. Which one of those? <laughs> <laughs> Catherine has conviction about Ooh. conflictions. I'm convicted. I'm conflicted about my conviction. <laughs> do you have any convictions that you base your life on? Um, I have positive and negative convictions. Give us one positive <laughs> conviction. Conviction is I believe that God exists. Did everybody hear that? She believes God exists. Okay. The Rutherford family, conviction. Let's hear it. Do you have a conviction you base your life on? Every day it gets better. Every day it gets better. So that would be a conviction in what? Things get better? Conviction. Kind of, hey, here's James. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I had a conviction not to start until James got here. You may proceed. <laughs> and the boss of the house, Katya. Okay. So my first question was... Uh, what are your convictions? So, Katya, what's a conviction that you have that you base your life on? <laughs> that, uh, my, my husband is my eternal subject. <laughs> Katya said her conviction, her first conviction in her, in her mind is that her husband is her eternal subject. Okay, I said it, Bobby. James, what's your conviction? <laughs> That my wife is the best ever. <laughs> <laughs> my wife is the best ever. Okay. Uh, Eleanor in the back, what's your conviction? Um, what is the conviction you base your life on? That eventually there's victory. Eventually there's victory, okay. Mr. Mike Thick, what's your conviction? A, a conviction you base your life on? Uh, you can be successful in life, uh, centered on God, and so you can be, Mike Thick says, you can be, what was that? You can be successful in life based upon centering on God. Centering on God. And serving your family. And serving your family. All right. This is Thick. What's a conviction you have? I, I did. <laughs> Sorry, community. She, she, oh, she, has, she, she has a conviction of serving the community. Next row. Conviction. What's a conviction you have? Uh, I'm convicted that if you pray hard and try to live a good life, you will go to heaven. Someday. Prayer. Conviction of prayer yeah. and hard work. And living, and it, li living, hard, trying to live a good life. Trying to live a good life and you'll go to heaven. That's probably the best one so far. Prayer. What was the second one? Wow. Excuse me. Prayer. <laughs> just my opinion. You can disagree with me completely like Catherine, so it's no problem. Prayer. And what? Living a good life. Good life. And I thought you said something about hard work, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. Hard work. Prayer. Living a good life and hard work. Okay, next. Conviction? What's the conviction? Actually, yeah. um, waking up and going to be able to some form of reading scripture. Conviction about... Reading scripture in the morning and the evening. Conviction about reading scripture in the morning and the evening. All right, next person. Conviction. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm a foreigner. I don't know. You don't know it? <laughs> what, is, what is something you think it's important to live your life by? Something, I mean. Yes, my family. Family? Okay. They put out with me. <laughs> okay, so conviction. 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 What is your conviction? Anybody else have anything to add? So what is God's conviction? Does God have a conviction? I mean, you're talking about God, right? You're at a church, right? So maybe if God has a conviction, you're getting some inspiration about conviction is important because God inspired you, right? I sure did inspire you. <laughs> He's joking. Um, so right, so God inspired you somehow to come to these convictions, right? So where do sometimes convictions come from? 
sometimes they come from difficulty, right? If you have difficulty, then at some point you realize you have to be, have a conviction about studying scripture in the morning, studying scripture at night, right? You get, you get that habit. So, True Parents Course is our life of faith, or True Parents Activity is our life of faith. Um, my conviction is that God has five convictions. And that we have to understand what are God's convictions so that we can work with those convictions. Otherwise, we're going to have difficulty as a blessed family. My, my contention is that our small group that we have the responsibility to establish is our blessed family. Who here feels at some point that on the family level, maybe even between husband and wife level, you don't really agree about much? I'm the only one. Two hands, I'm holding a mic. <laughs> Two hands up. So my contention, my conviction, is that we can agree on the convictions of God. That we're created to agree on the convictions of God. So, see this small group? You know what? So you got this handout, right? So I fold the handout kind of in half, so it's just this part. And it says, if God promised to bless you, bless you if you follow his instructions. Every promise has a premise, there's a condition attached. So the whole Sunday service is based upon just this one chart and conviction, how that relates with it. So if we start out using, using the ammunition given by the audience, we have conviction about prayer in the morning, prayer in the evening, and study of God's word every day, morning and evening. So what does that conviction do? That conviction of prayer and study of God's word is growing our spirit. Do you guys know what the uh, discipleship is talking about? It's a process of conforming your life to Christ. So the essence of True Parents Course is that we're supposed to study God's Word, and as we study God's Word and conform our life to Christ, we grow. So that's the concept of discipleship. So in our small group, in order to establish a healthy small group, we have to have the conviction that we need to build this bridge between our small group and our family to discipleship, which is essentially to God's Word. Can I get an amen? Amen. So if we can agree on the first thing, which is, I in my life and I in my family, we need God's word in our life. That's a conviction. I need God's word in my life. So what I'm saying is if we don't have an agreement in terms of conviction as individuals, as families, and as a church community, we'll be here for another 10 years with the same amount of people. However, if we become crystal clear on the convictions of God in our life, we'll have strength to overcome whatever we're struggling with. Who knows if my favorite words are divine principle. Everyone is struggling. I'm struggling. When I first joined the church, people were like, what are you struggling with? I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm struggling with everything. And it was like, are you kidding me? I got to get up early. I got to listen to this guy over here, and he's an idiot. And then I got to do fundraising. I mean, all this. I'm not basically, my professional job when I joined the church was to struggle with everything. So that was, I had a really good experience, actually. So... The first conviction is it building this bridge. So what I'm saying is that God has convictions. And once we understand God's convictions, my contention is God's first conviction is that we need God's Word as a small group and as a family to study God's Word together and to pray together. So this is a bridge. What happens with bridges? Do bridges just naturally happen? Does a San Francisco bridge just naturally appear? No, someone has to build the bridge, right? So we have to build the bridge in our own life of studying God's Word. Whatever it takes, we have to build a bridge in our own life between our family and God's Word. A process of discipleship. We have to build this bridge. So James's job as a father is to study God's Word and build that bridge in his own life and figure out how to build that bridge in his family. The way James does it is not the same as me. Getting up early in our family and studying God's Word doesn't work. We got kids. We got people whose profession is to just sleep until everyone's gone. We got, I mean, we, it just doesn't work in our family to wake up early and study God's Word. So we do it at night. 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night, we have a closing meeting, we pray and we study God's Word. Because it's not going to work at 5 a.m. in the morning. Kids got to go to school. So based on my small group, I had to figure out a way to build this bridge between my small group and God's Word. So what is another conviction of God? 
Another, well, let's, let's back up a second. What do you think true parents conviction in, in terms of true father, how many pages of God's word did true father read out loud during his life? There's a number somewhere. Somewhere in the spirit world there's a number. 5,627 times father read, his, read God's word out loud, right? Who spent time with true father? Who went to speeches they thought was going to be two hours, turned to 12 hours, or 10 hours, or 9 hours, right? So in terms of setting a record, in terms of quantitative number, True Father had this clear conviction that he has to bring result in his life of studying God's Word. So True Father is saying, True Father's lifestyle was saying, we have to think about what is the number here? How many pages of God's Word are we reading? I mean, ideally, we'd be able to tell as individuals and families in the community the health of our community based upon how much we study God's Word. So when we come to church and we see this chart, we should be thinking, or if you put it up on your wall, you should be thinking, okay, every day, how many pages am I studying God's Word? Is it one page every day? I mean, if you did that one page every day for 365 days a year, your life would change because God could, could work in your life and renew your mind. So we have to figure out what that number is in order to, in order to improve our life. So the second conviction is, how many people do you think that, okay, let's, let's slow down a second. In the Word, this, this is God's, this, this process, these, these bridges, this is God's process that has been going on since the time of Adam and Eve. After the kingdom of heaven is established, still this process is going to be going on. Does that make sense? So that this is the original position we're supposed to be in, right? And if we're supposed to go this way, Adam and Eve were born, and fulfill their responsibility, they walk a process and they build the kingdom of heaven, right? So this is the original ideal, original process. Does that make sense? Adam and Eve receive God's word and they're supposed to fulfill the purpose of creation, right? And build the kingdom of heaven. Does anybody understand that, that statement? No? Is that clear? So that's the principle of creation, right? Then what happened? They went the opposite way and they're over here. So what is the process of restoration? Instead of going this way, following Satan's word, they have to turn around, change your thinking, repent, study God's word, and then follow this direction, right? So this is the process of restoration. Get to the, the original. But then, that's those same skills that you're learning, you still have to keep going to build the kingdom of heaven, right? So it's the same thing. It doesn't change. You still got to, in, in the kingdom of heaven, you got to get up and go to work? No. Yeah, you do. You have to, because you're born, even in the kingdom of heaven, someone's going to be born at the bottom of Mount Everest, and their, their goal in life is going to be to climb Mount Everest. So the kingdom of heaven is not sitting around all day watching YouTube videos, eating chocolate cookies. The kingdom of heaven is, I'm sorry to break it to you, but you know what? Who thinks that life is hard? You know what? Life is supposed to be hard. Who thinks that the kingdom of heaven is going to be easy? I don't think so. The kingdom of heaven is going to be hard. The kingdom of heaven is going to be, I'm living in the kingdom of heaven. Right now. Right. So, if, if, if you wake up in the kingdom of heaven, what is God going to ask you to do? Go back to sleep? He's going to give you a goal so big that you're going to want to go back to sleep. God is going to say, look, James, oh, thank you, James. You asked me what you should do with your life. What, what, is, you know what, James? I want you to do this. I mean, what happened to Noah? God asked Noah to do something crazy. What happened to Abraham? God asked Abraham to do something crazy. Asked Moses to do something crazy. Asked Jesus to do something crazy. Asked Father to do something crazy. So God is going to ask you to do something very difficult, even in the kingdom of heaven, so you can grow and so you can be excited. I mean, what happens if you sit home all day and do nothing? You get depressed. So you got to get out. You're created to go out and do things and build the kingdom of heaven. Right? That's why I think a lot of people leave the church because they don't realize that the church can be the most exciting place to be, to receive a clear direction from God about something to do in your life, to challenge yourself and go do something. Rutherford's son is excited. Now why? Because he's working hard. It's something he's interested in doing. He's working six, seven days a week, working hard. So that's, you know, God God established us and created us to work hard. Okay, so what I'm saying is that originally, 
Adam and Eve, before they heard God's word, were unchurched. They, they heard God's word and they moved into a relationship with God, establishing a healthy small group, and they were supposed to build the kingdom of heaven following this process. So what I'm saying is that all throughout history, God has been using a strategy of moving people from unchurched to some faith group. That's a bridge. How many people went out this week, do you think, and invited in the greater Sacramento area people to some faith group? Uh, Jehovah Witnesses probably invited 250,000 people this week. Mormon Church probably divided, invited how many people? Millions of people this week. Catholic Church, they invite a lot of people. I know where I, where I live, there's a new Catholic Church there, and they're inviting people all the time. So you know what? Even after the kingdom of heaven, even after the kingdom of heaven comes, even after people say, oh, the, the uh, Family Federation, it's not a Family Federation, right? It's not a church. But this process doesn't change. Even the Family Federation process is the same as a church process. Mm -hmm. Because what is the purpose of history? To build healthy small groups. To build healthy families. So whether you're a Mormon or an LDS member or a Jehovah Witness or Unification Church member, whatever, your job is to know how to build a bridge to bring unchurched to Sunday service and Sunday service to a small group to establish a blessed family. At some point we'll have a meeting with Muslims, Christians, and Jews. We'll be asking them, okay, give your testimony. What do you do the most effectively to invite people from the unchurched to Sunday service? As LDS or as, as, as uh, whatever church you're in. Does that make sense? So even after people receive the blessing, they have to learn how to build this bridge from unchurched to Sunday service and have a conviction to come and meet once a week and to offer their new... Why do people come to church on Sunday? What's the purpose? Is the purpose because the preaching is so good? It's because the music is so good? It's because it's always uplifting? No, it's because you come the first day of the week to offer your week, right? You offer what you have to God. That's the purpose of Sunday service. So even in the kingdom of heaven, we're still going to be meeting, I think, once a week. Maybe buildings will be different, but we'll have the attitude, once a week we want to offer our life to God as a, as a community meeting. So what is our conviction about bringing the unchurched to Sunday service? What is God's conviction? What do you think God's conviction is? James, what do you think God's conviction is about bringing people from the unchurched to church? Absolute. Absolute. Mike, what do you think? What is God's conviction about bringing the unchurched to Sunday service? Pastor Charles, what do you think the founder's conviction is regarding bringing people from the unchurched to Sunday service? He wants the whole world to know God. Right, so... Everyone. What do you think... The founder's conviction is about bringing the unchurched to Sunday service every week. Bring them. Bring them. Okay. So how many people does how many people are, are supposed to become blessed couples? Everybody. How many people are supposed to hear divine principle? Everybody. So we have to have a conviction about building a bridge from the unchurched to Sunday service. You know, after service today, we're going to be talking a community meeting talking about a church building, right? So the church is not a building; it's it's people. People are the church. So if we, if we are working together to restore all things and restore people, and we build a process, we have conviction and process, then we can clearly build a healthy church. Does that make sense? So what is, what is, um, so basically I'm saying is there's five basic convictions of God. That is bringing people from the unchurched to some kind of faith group, Sunday service, and then a conviction about teaching people how to build a healthy small group, how to build a blessed family. So that applies no matter what church you go to, how the conditions to establish a healthy blessed family. And that the core of that is studying God's word and then serving in your local church and serving out the world. So let's bring up James again. James is the best. So James and James's family, they're studying God's word and James and Kati are thinking, okay, God has a conviction we need to be serving as a family in our local church. How do we do that? So that's a conviction. Conviction of service to your local church. Does that make sense? Mike Thick and Tomoko Thick have some kind of conviction about serving in their local church. Why can I say that? Because Mike keeps showing up. His wife keeps showing up. 
They keep going out and serving and doing something in the local church, right? What did they have yesterday? What was the event? Women's Federation, that was a ministry. So there's some kind of conviction about everybody needs a ministry in the, some way to serve. And then some way, a conviction about mission, going out in the world and evangelizing. Does that make sense? So what is, what is the, what is the uh, definition of evangelism? Is it giving God's word? Is it um, giving our testimony to people about how God's working in our lives? My contention is that the core, core bedrock of our faith is evangelism. That's giving God's word. When you share God's word with people through action or attitude or deed, then you're evangelizing. You're, you're giving God's word to people. So I, my contention is that the core, core essence of history is evangelism. Why is it that so many Bibles are printed throughout history? Because God keeps inspiring people to print God's word and give God's word. What is the founder of this church always over and over again? Why don't you buy 400 books and give them out? A couple years later, why don't you buy another 400 of these books and give them out? Why don't you buy 400 divine principle books and give them out? Why don't you buy a number of these speeches and give them out? So what is that conviction? That we have to always be finding a way to build a bridge of giving God's word, evangelizing. Right? So who's the first person we need to evangelize? Ourself. Ourself, through study of God's word. So my contention is that true parents' course or activity is our life of faith, meaning that we have to have these five convictions in our life. A conviction to bring people from unchurched to Sunday service. I mean, you at least have the conviction, right, that you need to keep coming. You're making that condition and you're offering. Even though you're upset, even though you're whatever, you keep coming and saying, okay, God, I'm going to offer this, this, this Sunday to you. I'm going to offer whatever I got, $5, $10, $20, make an offering, tithing. You're making that offering, right? And through that, God is able to work in your life through making that condition. And then after Sunday service, you have a, con a conviction to build a healthy small group. Who here wants to build a healthy family? So that's a conviction. To move people from just coming to Sunday service to how you build a healthy small group, how you build a blessed family. That's a conviction. A conviction about not only attending a local church, but a conviction about I will build a blessed family. No matter what anybody else does, I will build a healthy blessed family. And how do you do that? By having a conviction of studying God's word. How many people here other than me have a lot of problems in their life? So that means that we should be praying and studying God's word. Because somewhere out there, there's a book or a part in, in the Bible or the divine principle or God's word that will apply to how you can overcome your situation. Conviction about ministry in the local church. How do we build a conviction to serve in our local church? And how do we build a conviction to go out in the world? You know, many young people don't want to attend local church. Why is that? Because they want to go out and shake up the world. They want to hear testimonies of people that went out during the week and did crazy things. Climbed mountains, beat up robbers, pulled out their gun and drew it out on some bad guy. I mean, you know, there's young people, they don't want to just sit around and talk about stuff. They want to come to Sunday service on Sunday and hear about someone who really overcame their situation and is honest and, and, and really brings victory. So we have to have a conviction that we got to do something in the world. We have to get out of our easy chair and go do something. For some people, that's, you know, like I told my wife one time, I said, honey, you need to just get a job. You know, she came here to this country and she was having difficulty. I said, no problem, honey, get in the car. <laughs> Drove her to McDonald's, this is the middle of Illinois. Go in there, get an application, get a job. It was simple. And that fear just, she was like, wow, I'm in the United States. I don't know any English. Well, she knew something. She's there, a little McDonald's suit on. I said, what are you doing? She's like, I'm making fries. <laughs> so they taught her to make fries. <laughs> and I went there the, other, the next day, and, or someone else came back. who was actually a uh, church and I was working at. And so the lady came back, because I told her the same thing. And she got a job there, and she was laughing. She said, yeah, I went there to get a job, and I don't know where these people are coming from. This is the manager, right? The manager was like, I don't know, some Chinese lady came in, and she's not working here. It was my wife, who's Japanese, so... So anyway, we have, to, we have to have a mission from God to go out and do crazy things. 
So God promised to bless you if you follow his instructions. Every promise is a premise. So that's it, guys. Conviction. We have to have a clear idea of what are the five convictions. We have to have a conviction to bring people to Sunday service, a conviction to bring to build a healthy small group, blessed family. Conviction that as a blessed family, we have to really study God's word and have the process of discipleship so we can grow. And as a um, blessed family, we need to have a conviction of doing something in our local church to serve other believers and a conviction of go out in the world. So if we agree on that, then we can come every Sunday and say, okay, give testimony of how we're going forward. And what happens when we have those convictions? We're able to restore all things and restore people. So I'll just close with this one part. You know, if you say the four spiritual laws track, which is um, Bill Bright, Bill Bright did it, which is like the four spiritual laws track he gave out, talking about people to accept Jesus. And there's a simple chart about process of restoration and how to live your life. So basically, it's interesting about the divine principle is that in the divine principle, basically, it's accepting everything Jesus did and then going to a new level. So always God's providence starts out here and then it goes to a new level. So really, the essence about true parents' course of our life of faith, and you can share this with anybody, no matter what church they go to, is we're trying to quantify what kind of results we have to build in our life to bring the kingdom of heaven. You know, in a the, in the traditional Christian church, it's like, if you don't do this, if you don't do... If you're not serious about discipleship, ministry, and mission, then you're, you have a loss of rewards. When you go to spirit world, you'll go there, but then you'll realize that what you did was less than what was possible. You could have done a lot more, a loss of, a loss of rewards. That's the kind of attitude in, in a lot of really highly successful Christian churches is that like, you should work out your best so that when you get to the end of your life, you're not sad when you go to spirit world, that you, you're missing out on what you could have done with your life in terms of helping people. So the part, one part of the second coming, true parents, is true fathers adding absolute numbers to everything. So he's saying, unless we bring a certain amount of result in terms of witnessing the people and building a tribe, being successful in building a tribe, we, we are not establishing a healthy, blessed family unless we have that attitude of result. So if we, we have to start thinking about how we can have the conviction to do things so we can bring result. Right? If you have, like, my, my daughter's on GPA, when you have people come up and give testimony at GPA or some kind of um, successful church where it's really bringing results in terms of bringing people, who do you have to give testimony? You, you have to give testimony, not the person that's, like, depressed and ready to kill himself and has been sleeping in the van for, like, two months, and the team captain had to basically... Get him, wake him up every morning, gave him a $7, and he went and bought food and slept all day in the park, and he came back. I mean, that's not the kind of person. The kind of person you have to give testimony at workshop is somebody who struggled, but then they overcame. Who gets up and says, yeah, it was difficult, it was difficult, but I could overcome. So we have to have the concept, we have to change our concept from talking about results is somehow judgment, to talking about results is, hey, what is the path to victory? Why do you want to hear about Mike give a testimony or his wife give a testimony about something he did that's victorious? Because we want to become victorious, right? There's something Catherine has in her life that's victorious. Why is she still here? Why? She, get, she, she keeps working. You can see her kids have a good spirit. So, you know, everybody has something in their life that's good. So we have to really think about, okay, how do we evaluate our own lives so we can bring more results in terms of all things and people, restoring all things and people, so we can give a victorious testimony and inspire others. Amen? Amen. Have a good week. God bless you.